So, um, very excited to be doing this. Uh, you all met King Howard yesterday, and you should know that he's also written a column some years ago, or a piece of journalism called um, If I Ruled the World. And in that, he said he would outlaw cycling and uh, musicals after 1950 and gawping, and that uh, every day would be the first day of autumn because autumn turns the mind to seriousness. So first of all, Howard, before we start, are you doing okay? Because we're not in your dusty street. You, you said you don't like the congenial leafy space, so. Doing my best. You, okay, doing good. Doing my best. Excellent. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for coming. And we're going to start, Howard's going to do a short reading uh, from Mother's Boy, and then we'll get into a conversation and have time for questions. Okay. Do I need this? Or can yes. you, do yes. 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 you don't have you don't think again about that. No. We got one. Okay, let's do it. My, my mother died today. It is the 3rd of May, 2020. She is 97 years old. I have had a premonition of her dying for the last 70 of those years, on occasions hearing her calling my name in the night. But last night she was silent, and today she crept under the radar Today she crept under the radar of my forebodings. Many are succumbing to COVID-19, but my mother hasn't died of any virus. Two days ago, she complained of a bad pain in her head and fell almost immediately into unconsciousness. Quietly and unobtrusively, she drifts out of this world altogether. This was always her chosen way of going, without fuss or notice. I am upset that the pain she complained of was in her head. She feared for her head. I too, when I was small, feared for her head. As a young woman, she suffered migraines so badly that when she went to bed with her hands over her eyes, I was afraid she would not survive the night. Ours was a mental relationship. It was our heads that joined us. I dread dying with a pain in mine. We'd spoken on the phone a few days before she died, and but for my having to repeat everything I said twice, three times, if it was a joke, we'd had a good conversation. At the beginning of the year, when the virus was first mentioned, she had expressed surprise I was taking any precautions. Oh, Howard, you're not worrying about that, are you? as though she hadn't schooled me to prepare for the most apocalyptic eventualities. In the day I left home to go to university, she'd reminded me to take enough toilet paper. What, for three years? Until you settle in. I think Cambridge will have toilet paper, I said, but I took a roll just in case. Yet now that we really did have to contend with a calamity equal to her anxieties, she had turned perversely carefree. Oh, Howard, for goodness sake. But by the time of our final conversation, she had rethought, and she was back to her old apocalyptic self. The virus will kill us all, she said. After which she moved on seamlessly to cheese. I'd been sending her gifts of mature cheddar cheese because we all like mature cheddar cheese in our family, grilled on toast, and because she can't eat chocolates and doesn't much care for flowers. This cheddar cheese grills especially well. But I don't want you to keep on sending me, she said. It must be costing you a fortune. I told her I could afford cheddar cheese. Her reasoning wasn't always easy to follow, but I thought I could see what led her to ask next how my book was going. It's okay. What is it again? It's a memoir. What's it about? Me, Ma, what do you think? She sounded concerned. Is that a good idea? Probably not. What about you? About how I became a writer? Oh, you were always a writer. You were born a writer. I know, but I was 40 before I wrote anything. So what was stopping you? That's one of the questions I'm... 
adding, um, it's one of the questions I'm asking in my memoir. But the short answer is being Jewish. Being Jewish, you aren't going to be horrible about being Jewish, are you? I hope not. After all, if it was being Jewish that held me back, it was being Jewish that got me going. I have said her reasoning took unexpected turns, but what she said next soared into the realms of the fantastical. She told me she loved me. I'm ashamed to say I roared with laughter. Ma, I said, that's not the kind of thing we say to each other. And it wasn't. Love talk was not us. Well, I do love you, she said. I should have known then that she was dying. I'd laughed, but I've, I was overwhelmed by feelings I didn't recognize. I'm glad, I said. And then I plunged into the deep, dark chambers of the hitherto unexpressed. Because I love you. There. Said it. She nearly a hundred, I in my seventies, and we'd finally said that we loved each other. It astonishes me. What, that we'd said it, or that it had taken so long? Both. Great. Thanks, Howard. Your mother comes across in so many ways in this, in this memoir. And one of the things that I was very struck by was that you say that she was the person who brought you into literature in a way because she read you a lot of doom-laden 19th century poetry. <laughs> and as a poet, I'm interested in, I suppose, maybe the beginning of where that sense of uh, language or words or writing began, and whether indeed poetry is something that you've continued with uh, in your life, uh, an appreciation of, if not writing. Yes, I have. Um, not necessarily in the sense that I read a lot, and I'm very bad at keeping up with contemporary poetry. I am, in my bones, an old, an old-fashioned man. I like the past. But, I, but what happens is that the, what goes on happening is that the poetry she read me and then the poetry I studied at university and taught at university, I go on hearing in my head. So I, a day will rarely go in which I don't find a reason to quote the Lady of Shalott. You'd think it would be difficult in a modern life to find a reason to quote, but I find a reason. It, it, the, the rhythms are what stay in your mind, the rhythms of, of poetry. And Shakespeare, of course, and when I write, I hear them. And I hear my mother, the thing is, I hear my mother saying them too. And I think you are, a, and she was not an educated woman, no one taught her, she just found these poems herself. And I think one is very lucky if the rhythms of literature are associated with love, if they are blessed by love, if someone you loved and whose voice you loved said those first, read those first poems to you, or read those first stories, they stay in the mind even longer and with an even greater poignancy, I think. So I just want to point out that if you were listening to Howard, I don't know if you were watching his feet, and in fact, his toes gently swished when he was reading, and you're still gently swishing your toes. Um, when we met the first night, and he found out I was a dancer, he said, oh, I'm all head and no body. And I want to challenge you on that because I think you write a lot about the body. Um, there's a lot of, um, even if it's body as failure or bumbling or disappointment, but um, there's a lot of sex, there's a lot of desire, um, the body is present. And, and I think uh, this sense of rhythm and poetry and movement, it's even there in your body as you're speaking now. So I thought I'd just point that out. But maybe you want to talk a little bit about why you think it's all... And you mentioned in your, in your piece about the relationship with your mother as well. So. I think what I want to talk about now is my toes, actually. <laughs> yeah. if I, I, can everybody see? <laughs> How extraordinary. The, see, my toes of, of... This would be the first time I've been on a stage with anybody with my toes uncovered. People don't see my toes. I even try to conceal my toes from my wife because I think I've got rather ugly toes, actually. <laughs> but now you mention it, don't you think, maybe? 
But then, should we, should, I mean, we could stay with toes. It's up to you, really. No, I, w I would like to know about the relationship with body or the sort of physicality or desire. I think that um, there's a lot of that in your work, and I wonder why you, you feel that that's not an area. I think, yes, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, because I do write about it. Um, I felt gauche. A lot of this book is about how uncomfortable I felt as a baby. I didn't like the way I was dressed. They put babies in the most uncomfortable things. There was things they called, do you have them, do you have them in this part of the world? Romper suits, where they kind of... Onesies? They, they wrap you up. I mean, they're supposed to have... There used to be a thing called swaddling clothes in the Victorians, or earlier swaddled their children. And then we, we, we were supposed to let children free. But I was in this thing and it had a stud. You stud here so you were just I was uncomfortable and um, throughout my babyhood and I went on being uncomfortable physically uncomfortable in what I was given to wear and then in what I chose to wear because I chose badly and then it just became a kind of way of being really a way of being I thought amusing about myself to other people to say I'm clumsy and I'm gauche and I'm awkward to it, uh, it was also true and I'd got it I think from my mother who, once she had children, then started to become uncomfortable about her body. And I think she passed that on to me. We were, the family was divided. My father wasn't at all uncomfortable about his body. My father was very free um, and physical. And my mother, to, it's partly to do with, I won't let this go on too long, it's partly to do with the fact that they come, the very different worlds of Jewishness from which they come. My father was, was Ukrainian. Um, so he was like he was one of he was like a, one of those Ru you can't say Ukrainian and Russian in the same breath now, but I have to. He was one of those men from that part of the world who you could imagine wrestling a bear. He was that kind of a man. He danced the Kozatsky. He was a very very physical, funny man with his body, very square, short man. Yeah, and a magician as well. Um, and and he, I, I don't know what his toes looked like because I never saw his toes. So I don't know who my toes come from, actually. Whereas my mother was from Lithuania, which was a, where they were much more, the Jewish world she came from was much more cerebral, much more intellectual, and very critical. The Lithuanian Jews were very critical of Ukrainian Jews. So they were, they were polar opposites, if you like. My mother, introverted, awkward, awkward altogether socially, and awkward about her body. Not when she was a young girl, but once she was a married, once she was a, a mother, which is itself interesting. My father was completely free and relaxed, and I clattered. I still clatter between between the two. Yeah, but I I love that that sense of uh, contradiction, I suppose, and I think I wanted to ask you also um, this sense of um, I guess being a serious writer who is interested in the comic. I know that you have a bugbear about being sort of defined as a comic writer, mm. but we were talking about sort of non-vegetarian sharks the first night and about toxic positivity and this kind of oxymoronic sense of bringing together, um, I guess, tragic comedy. Uh, so w why has that been your preferred mode, this bringing together? Or, or, or maybe why has is, is it been so important to have the comic? Well, certainly that's easier to talk about than the tragic comic mode, which is difficult, I don't know. I think I, t I, think I went to comedy because it was self-defense. If you make a joke about yourself, you're in a strange kind of way in charge of yourself. If you laugh at yourself, then you beat the other people who might laugh at you. I can, there was a sense that I could beat, I could win in any competition to make fun of me I would win. P people had other things to do with their life rather than make fun of me. But I had a sense that um, when people did want to make fun of me, I couldn't bear it, so I had to beat them. So I had to be funnier about myself. And I also noticed when I was a little boy that, um, and I was a shy little boy, because I was my mother's little boy, not my father's little boy. Had I been my father's little boy, I'd have been dancing the Kazatsky and showing my toes. But because I was my mother's little boy, I was locked in myself and shy. And I found that when words, when I, the words were a way out to get people to listen to me. And I also discovered that if I made a little boy's joke, my mother's friends 
some of whom I thought were very glamorous at the time, would laugh. And I liked the way their faces went. When I liked the idea that I could make their faces sometimes suffuse with the redness of pleasure. Uh, and I could cause that. And I could cause that by jokes. So jokes were a way of self-protection, but also a way of gaining some ascendancy over the shy boy that I hated so much. You mentioned that you were, I mean, you were 40 when you first published. In the book, you talk a lot about sort of whinging on about, and anyone who's a writer here knows what that is like, that sense of uh, having a, an idea of writing or wanting to write and then not doing it. And it's a terrible feeling of guilt and, um, yeah. I suppose, feeling useless. Um, and I, I was really struck by something you said about how, for you, it was more the form of the novel that you were excited and invested in and that you were not so worried about content or what you were going to write about, but you knew that it had to be the novel. And it, you know, the death of the novel keeps getting announced every few years. And I, I think it would be nice at a literary f festival to talk about maybe why the novel as a form has endured for you and what, even though this is a memoir, and we get to maybe why you switched to memoir uh, or why you felt that you needed to go to the memoir, but I'd like to hear the relationship with the novel and what, what does the no novel do for us? I suppose it's a question of why, since my mother read me poetry, why I didn't write poetry and why I went to novels. She also read me bits of novels and, and, had, her, and had novels that she liked, so I was introduced to novels quite early. I don't think I read children's stories very much. I don't think she was interested in them. I don't think I had that period of um, being engrossed in children's book, which is what makes me say often, I wish people didn't write for children. I think the best books for children. I say, you want to educate a child, as soon as possible, give a child a late Henry James novel, as soon as possible, and let the child struggle with it. But the idea of books just for children I, I think it wastes, I think it, w lots, I think the contemporary child's ch childhood, intellectual childhood, is wasted on stuff that they are more intelligent than actually. Um, and I think their parents encourage the child in them to linger longer. That's just a side point. I liked novels, I think, because um, I, liked the, I liked the collision of voices. I liked the clash of voices. And I liked the fact that if a novel was read properly, no one could ever say, ah, you think that, ah, you say that. Because I liked being able to say, no, I didn't. That character said that. I liked the dramatic form of the novel. Um, but I also, at the same time, liked... I was a, a good essay writer as a little boy. I liked writing an essay. And good novels often have essays embedded in them. Certainly my novels have lots of essays in, embedded. So it was a kind of dramatic essay. It was an essay in which you could express what you thought and then, and then question it, and then question it dramatically by having other people having different thoughts. I always liked, I mean, I cite D.H. Lawrence a lot because I admired him and I read his novels quite young, really. I read Sons and Lovers maybe when I was about 12 or something. And Lawrence always said that the, um, the novel is the one great book of life. Um, and the novel is the place where whatever the novel, much of what I said last night, whatever a novelist thinks, the novel will probably contradict him. And that idea of being in a form in which you expressed yourself but expressed the possibility that, that you were wrong and contradicted yourself, I enjoyed the play of that, which was sometimes comic but doesn't have to be comic. Yeah. And all the best novels, I think, do that. And so... To move from that then, was it, um, is it the experience of writing memoir then, that, that sense of the, the covering or the shelter that this fluidity allows, does it become somewhat exposed, do you feel, what's your relationship then because you have to reveal it in a different way? When I, when I was near to finishing my memoir and I met my agent said, how's it going? Uh, this is a new form for you and I said, I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure this is any more true than my novels. In fact, it might be that there's more truth about me in my novels than... He said, don't say that to anybody. <laughs> I'd rather you don't say... So I haven't said that to anybody. But it's... But it, I didn't feel I was embarking on something entirely different, to be honest with you. I didn't. It reminded me the experience of writing about myself, 
Some would say, well, that's all you've ever done, Howard. We've only ever written about yourself, so you're just writing about yourself again in a different form. But I did enjoy, one of the reasons for starting was that I felt I had to make amends for something. Uh, I didn't want to apologize, it wasn't that. But I discovered as I was getting old that I was writing short, short pieces that I didn't know what to do with them about, about, about guilt, about very precise guilt, being guilty of a bad father, having been a bad father, having been a bad husband, having been a bad son, having been a terrible friend. And I was doing lots of these pieces, and I thought, well, there's a picture beginning to emerge, to emerge now, which is that you've been altogether a really bad person, a really, really bad person. Not on a grand scale, not imprisonably bad, because my life story isn't on a grand scale. That's partly what I write about. How do you make a thing, how do you make a thing dramatic when it's on a small scale? My life has been on a small scale. I've lived a coward's life. Um, which is what my mother wanted for me. Don't do this, don't do that, be careful, be careful. So I've lived the narrow, constrained life where much of the adventure of life has been here, really. In here, and then in a few close relationships. Um, being in love is, is, is important, and thinking about myself um, is, is important. And did it change? Did any of those things change when I was writing this memoir? Did I actually make amends? Did I actually make ap apologies? No, but I thought I was able to work out better why I'd been like that. What the use of that is, that does it help me to know in what sense I'd been a... Well, I knew I'd been a bad all of those things. Did it help me to find out why? I don't know. But I feel it's probably a good thing that I've, that I've said it. A Coward's Life could be part two of the memoir if you... I'm not working on it already. I don't think... Done. Well, I, li I like the idea. <laughs> if, and I'll, I'll think of you and I'll think of that title if I write... But I don't think I'll do another one. I've just okay. finished a, a novel, so okay. I'm back to novel writing. And I'm just starting another novel. I'm happier, really, with, with novels. Yeah. There's an extraordinary scene in this book where you are with um, your second wife and you're, in a, you're doing s supplies, shopping, and you don't have enough money and... She's buying too many things, and you're getting agitated. And uh, she wants to buy two bottles of ketchup instead, and you're trying to get her to buy yeah. one. And the ketchup bottle smashes to the floor and breaks, and you say, you don't know how <laughs> to live here. And uh, then you, you say how that phrase, you don't know how to live, haunts the rest of your marriage. And um, I just think it must be hard to live with writers, because in a way, um, there is this sense of how novels teach us how to live or think about what it means to be alive, etc., etc., and writers are supposed to be observant and looking at people and all of this stuff. But you said it, and you quoted, I mean, just an interview, that you have basically blinded to everything besides yourself. So how, again, how this, this sense of egotism or the sort of extreme inwardness that maybe fiction writers are, are, or writers in general, maybe artists, are prone to, uh, along with, I guess, a real investment to what does it mean to be alive? Yes. Um, can I just say, to begin with, I was rather disappointed after you told the ketchup story that you thought that showed how hard I was to live with. I thought that showed how hard she was to live. No, no, she, she, to live. she was also she, a piece of work, Howard. Yes, yes, that, I, I agree. She broke the ketchup. You, I mean, yeah. you said a ketchup bottle fell. A ketchup bottle <laughs> fell like that. Bang, like that. You don't want me to buy a second bottle of ketchup? Bang, like that. How easy is that? This is not a place where I'm expecting you to... T this is not a divorce court. But were it a divorce court, I'd expect you to find for me. Yeah, and but nobody you... needs two bottles of ketchup at a time. I agree. She did. And she was Australian. Yes. Yeah. I just throw, I just throw that in. She was Australian. <laughs> but yes, um, something interesting came from. Yes, um, the selfish the writers are difficult to live with. And how does, one, how does somebody as selfish as most writers, indeed most artists are, manage to produce something that's beyond them? Well, as I said last night, because other things operate in them besides just them. But there's a wonderful quotation from Shelley that, um, that I picked up when I was a student from my teacher and that I always think about. Um, and Shelley, is, Shelley writes a poem called Peter Bell III, and it's about Wordsworth. 
who he'd adored at first, and then Wordsworth was a disappointment to the, genera to the younger generation of Romantic poets. And he t does something fantastic about egoism. You know, the, um, Wordsworth was re referred to as the egotistical sublime. And Shelley writes, he had as much imagination as a pint pot. He never could fancy any situation from which to dart his contemplation than that wherein he stood. And you think, well, that should be the end of it. For a writer, that should be the end of it. But his was individual mind that knew created all it saw. I mean, I think that's fa fascinating, that you create what you see. So you don't actually have to have... I mean, I'm incurious, and a writer should not be incurious. He's, he, uh, Shelley is arguing that Wordsworth was incurious. But you don't have to look out to, to create, because you can create what you see so that you make the world, if you like, in your vision. But nonetheless, you are making a new, a new world. So that lets me off the hook. That line, which I think is so wonderful about Wordsworth, I hope sort of explains me. He had as much imagination as a pint pot, but his was individual mind that knew created all it saw. I think that's just wonderful. Marvelous. Um, I'm going to open it up for, for some questions in a bit, but I just thought maybe um, I'll ask one more question. And um, um, I was reading this book about George Eliot recently, and I know that you're a big fan. Um, and she, she it, it was talking about how for her the primal emotion of... of why she wrote was fear, and for her husband it was anger. Um, fear, was it? Fear. Really? Really? And uh, I was wondering whether, um, you know, you've written a lot about disappointment and failure in the relationship, and, and I was just wondering, well, is there a primal emotion from which you think your writing stems from? I mean, fear could be part of it. Mm. Um, I've never asked myself, that's a very, that's a very testing question. Mm. That, that question has never been put to me before. Um, so I've never thought about what the answer would be. Um, there's part of me that, it's very odd that a shy person, when you write, you expose yourself, you know that. There is, and, and we can dress it up how we like. It's not really me I'm exposing, how we like. But nonetheless, um, it's a form of exposure. And it's so interesting that so many people who, who um, venture into that world of exposure are shy. So why would they do it? That's one of the great puzzles of writing. Why, if you are locked away in yourself, well, maybe that's the answer. Because you are locked away in yourself, you seek some way, way of getting, getting out of yourself. yourself. And, and if you can't do it personally, if you don't become... I once wanted to be a comedian, and then I tried it a little bit, and I was no good. And then I wanted to be an operatic tenor, a lyric tenor. I wanted to be Mario Lanza and then even more serious tenors than that. Um, on the stage with thousands of people. I do always long for the applause of thousands of people. You do, I'm not complaining. This will... <laughs> no, please, no, please. And yet I don't want anybody to see me. I think this this kind of contradiction. I think it's called the shy exhibitionist. Is that a known phrase? Yes, or the gregarious yes. hermit or something like this. The there's this, hermit, there's this strange thing of wanting to be seen but then hiding under the rock and wanting to be known and then, but don't see me too much. And I think we all struggle with this inner, outer sort of maybe. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think, that's, I think that's part of it. That's all, that's all I can imagine at this moment anyway. Yes. Yeah. Is yeah. part of it. And then I, I did have, I mean, it was made tangible for me because I had the, sh the shyness and the exhibitionism weren't just abstractions, they were made concrete. I was my mother's boy. My mother did protect me. She did look after me. She didn't want me to risk things. She told me I could be anything. She actually told me I had beautiful feet. I've just remembered. Somebody else did. She also told me I had long dancer's legs. So. <laughs> Never trust your mother. There my father is still never hope, said, Howard. There's still hope. <laughs> no, there's not hope that my legs will get longer. <laughs> that, that can't happen. Dancing, dancing on the island. Um, okay, let's have some questions from the audience. If anybody has a question, maybe just uh, raise your hand and, uh, or just stand up. Uh, yeah, there's somebody in the back. Um, you spoke about the, uh, the rhythm of poetry, and particularly um, Shakespeare. 
I wondered when you were writing Shylock is my name, whether uh, the Shakespeare's words or the rhythm in The Merchant of Venice, uh, if that had any, any influence on the way you approached the, uh, the novel. Totally, totally. I mean, I was just immersed in the play. Every, every sentence I wrote um, had to measure... I didn't think I was Shakespeare, and I didn't suppose that I could ever... I had to find a way of not looking as though I was rivaling or rewriting Shakespeare. But his language was there all the time. The language of Shakespeare has always, has always been with me, whatever I write. Usually it's Hamlet. I hear Hamlet all the time. I hear Hamlet's voice. Do I think of myself as Hamlet a bit? Yes. Did I think of myself as Shylock? No, not at all. But the, but the arguments in that play interested me a great deal. I'm one of the few people who don't think that's an anti-Semitic play at all. Um, that's partly because I will not accept that Shakespeare could have been anti-Semitic. I think there's a, there's a point when, a, when you are too intelligent to be anti-anything, really. Uh, but we're not here to discuss Shylock. But yes, every, every, every second. It's not my favourite play, and the poetry is not as irresistible. The Shylock poetry isn't irre irresistible to me. And even after steeping myself in that play and then going, going on and writing other things, it was not, The Merchant of Venice was not what I heard. I just went back to, I just went back to, went back to Hamlet. But yes, I couldn't operate as a writer if I didn't have... Shakespeare, it was Shakespeare what did it. Thanks. Do you think he was Australian? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry if you were Australian. I, on Howard's behalf. <laughs> oh, did you, hear, did you hear that? I heard an Australian accent, so um, anyway. When you, go out, when you go out to buy ketchup, how many bottles do you buy at a time? <laughs> Just the one. Good, good. Okay, um, questions? I want to stick with the Australian vibe. Well, okay, P Punita has a question. But you, you mentioned that you, o you had a botanical reaction when you went to Australia and that you opened like a flower like when a you arrived and yes. you closed like a flower. Yes. So I, um, maybe later you can talk a bit okay. about why such a pleasant thing would, you know, not be something that you it remained. It remained a pleasant thing. I only closed like a flower because I had to leave it. Oh. But I know I, I loved Australia. Australia enabled me. Australia was my escape. It's cruel to put it like this because I didn't want to escape from my mother. But it was a sense of escape from my mother. I stopped being shy when I got to Australia. I don't know why. They didn't make me. The English made me shy. The Australians did not make me shy. I think that makes perfect sense. Yes. Oh, yeah. Everybody gets it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How would you mention Shakespeare and all the classical? Writers, Lawrence, Wordsworth, Shelley, etc. Are there any modern writers that you enjoy? Um, Poets, novelists? Well, there is one in this room. I won't embarrass him by saying it, but there is one in this room. I'm, I mean, I'm reading Damon Gallagher's novel now. I think he's a, a fantastic writer. Um, but otherwise, there aren't many. I mean, I have reason to read Damon because we were together in a prize, and he was um, one. When I heard him read, I thought, he might be a better writer than I am, but I still want to win this prize. And then, so I'm glad he, I'm glad he then won it. So it's all clear now. I thought he was a fantastic writer. One or two others um, at that period, but I can't remember their names. I'm not generous. Um, I'm, in, I have too, I'm in competition too much with other writers. It helps me when they die. The easiest writer for me to like is, you know, as soon as I see the obituary, I think, thank God I can read them. I dare, I dare read them now. It is a very competitive profession. I think, was it Gore Vidal who said the reason that it's such a vicious profession, the profession of writers, is uh, there are too many fishing in the same pond, and the pond is too small. It's too small for us. Really, there should only be about ten writers at a time allowed, and then the gates come down. I mean, now it's ridiculous, just ridiculous. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people writing novels. That's not right. The novel can't take that. And going off to literary festivals and all of that, yeah, and Hi. competing for that as well. Um, you pop, what you do is you, 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 get led to, you get led to your tent at Hay on Wai or wherever you get led to your tent and as you, for your event, and as you, as you walk to your tent, you pass the other tents and you <laughs> see 
the, so you measure very, very quickly the, the length of their audience, the length of the crowd. So now, I, now I'm very good at it. I can go past and I go, Martin Amis, that's about 600. Julian Barnes, that's about 450. How many are in mine? And, I've, and of course, the time occasionally comes when your audience is not as long. I have a memory of Hey On Why, when A Suitable Boy was just published. And the country went mad for a suitable boy. I knew, I knew Vikram Seth when it, before he wrote that blockbuster, and he was a very nice, we had the same publisher, and he was a very nice, quiet boy, who I thought knew his place and was very respectful <laughs> to me. Uh, so I thought, this is, this is somebody I will go on and write, uh, read and enjoy. And then came a suitable boy. And I remember standing in the middle of a field in Hay on Wai with, with all the tents around, with a bunch of other writers, particularly... Uh, um, I remember Bernice Rubens, who was, who was deceased, alas, who was somebody I enjoyed writing and who won the Booker Prize very early, and several other writers. Um, and we, we were on later that day, and we stood in the middle of the... And we watched this, this event for Vikram Seth, and we watched the crowd for his tent spiral around, spiral around his tent, and then spiral around every other tent, and then go up the road into the town of Hay and Wire, and go out across Shropshire into Herefordshire, and then into Wales. We all just stood there. And um, that's not easy. <laughs> but we all try to be generous, and people say, well, he deserves it. It's a very good, of course he deserves it. It's, a very good, it's an ambitious novel. And that, but what we found helpful was to think it probably took him a long time to write. Questions. I yeah. have a question for you. So last evening you mentioned about somebody who fainted reading Jane Austen and you are a huge fan of George Eliot. How have women novelists inspired you and what is the major difference in their, uh, the way they portray emotions? What is the major difference you've spotted uh, in comparison to their male counterparts? I like to think of myself as gender conscious free. I never was a, when I was reading Jane Austen and George Eliot, I didn't think I'm, I, I will now go from, from Dickens and Henry James to women novel. I just didn't think like that. It's possible looking back that I felt this would be the influence of my mother, I guess. And that there, is there a, a womanly streak in me? I don't even like, because I'm gender free, I don't think like that. But I got on very well with, with, with even, you know, the, uh, a woman writer that a lot of, and male writers found difficult, Charlotte Bronte. I loved Charlotte Bronte. I, uh, Jane Eyre was one of the first novels that we read at school. I must have been 12 when I read it. I thought it was fantastic. I did not find anything kind of um, emotionally difficult from my life in that. The only thing about Charlotte Bronte that I didn't like was that she'd once been stupid, I thought, about Jane Austen um, because she found Jane Austen shrewish and... Um, and cold-blooded, really, uh, which I thought was a dumb thing to say about Jane Austen. What I liked about somebody like Jane Austen, Jane Austen is one of the toughest writers you will ever read. There is no man who is capable of the cruelty, I think, the social cruelty that Jane Austen is capable of. And a lot of male writers, I remember Kingsley Amis was one of them, saying, no, no, this is horrible, this is too cruel. I thought, come on, it's fantastic, it's exhilarating. She's thrilling to read because... She's savage, absolutely savage. If there's a character, she, in Persuasion, there's a character she doesn't like who's, who's um, after the same man that the, that the heroine is after. So she throws her off, she throws her off a, a what's it called, the, the cob in, in, in Lyme Regis, a kind of bridge. She just throws her off, throw her off. She doesn't quite die, we'll keep her. But that's what you do with a character you don't like. Bang, get rid of them. She was, she was terrific. So, I mean, if... The answer to that is not that I go, is that I go to, women, to, to, to women writers to, to encounter a more refined sensibility. Um, I, find a, I find a brutality that I find exhilarating. That wouldn't be true of, that wouldn't be true of George Eliot. But George Eliot's got a very, very... Um, it's madness to talk about a masculine mind. I like, George, I like the essayist in George Eliot. And I like the fact that George Eliot lectures me. I love being, you're not supposed to like being lectured, 
by a novelist. But when a novelist is supremely intelligent, to be lectured by a supremely intelligent novelist is a very thrilling thing. And when the lecture, or the sermon even, is dramatized, so, that the tr so it's not just an abstract truth you're getting, but it's the abstract truth as, as it relates to these physical flesh and blood writers, that is, that's thrilling. Yeah, thanks for that question. And I think, Howard, I'll just add that in your book, you, there is, you talk a lot about the sort of, there is this maleness of Cambridge or, you know, the, the sort of group of, of, of people you're with. And, and I think one of the things I really appreciated was how you also acknowledge that things for your sister and even for your mother, the, the idea of lives that they could possibly have had or led or the freedom with which uh, maybe... Um, was not the same. I think you, you did that very um, beautifully and um, it was wonderful to read that. Well, I'm interested... It's wrong. I mean, it's, it's madness to say you, you, read, you read about women and you're reading more about the inner life because women don't have a greater inner life uh, th than men. That doesn't make any sense. But some of the things that men like to read about and that men are supposedly known for the Adventure Book, for example. I've never read an Adventure Book. I think I read Biggles once, and I thought, I don't want to read about this. I've never read a, I've never read a thriller. I've never read, as soon as I see gum, I go, I'm not interested in this. It's a book, a novel with a gum in it. What's, what's... So much of what I've been doing, whether it's been conscious or not, has been about eschewing the idea of the man as the center role, as the man as hero. Some, I mean, if, if one of the questions had been, who's your favorite character in, in literature, I probably would have said um, Leopold Bloom in James Joyce, and not just because he's Jewish, but because he doesn't make anything happen. He is somebody to whom things happen. He, is, he was once a blotting paper. So I love that joke that James Joyce made. He was an, an absorbent man. He's a person who's um, betrayed by his wife, who's laughed at by his friends, um, who loses jobs, who gets kicked out of pubs for being Jewish. He is a victim. And what James Joyce makes you realize is it's much more interesting to be the victim of events than to be the person who makes events happen. So I guess I'm, I guess I'm the writer of victims, really. Last question, yes. yeah. Um, I'm really interested in the concept of separating the art from the artist that you mentioned last night in your keynote speech. And I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on an artist who's been convicted of a criminal offense Having receiving profits from the sale of their arts, is there a? Do you define a distinction there between separating the art from the artist, or are you solid across the board? If he's receiving, if he's receiving profits from the from the from the art, if the profits he's receiving are profits from the art, I see no reason why he shouldn't receive them. I mean, as well as, if you're saying he's in prison, as well as going to prison, is, that, is, is, is your means of likelihood, of livelihood, should you ever come out of prison, also to be taken away from you? How punitive do we have to be? I mean, I'm not saying now give him the money and let him live a life of luxury in prison. I'm not saying that. But the idea of taking a person's, a person's entitlements away from them because you don't like how they've lived their lives. Lock them up. I mean, I'm fine with that. And hang them even, if you like. Hang them and then give, but let, but still let the royalties pass down the family family line. You can't take away somebody's earnings because you don't like what they say. I mean, it's um, the, the um, I'm angrier about all that than I probably sounded last night. I think the idea that you can say that you're offended by a work and this has got any meaning whatsoever is so preposterous. It's got nothing to do with any. You don't like that person, tough. Who said you've got to like them? And I don't say, therefore, just leave it alone. You're entitled to say, I think this is a harmful book or some such thing. Fine, it's a, it's a, you can say it's a harmful book. Um, and that's just the end of it. But your offense, uh, one's offense does not describe a book. You, don't, you describe a book by saying it's, it's elegant, it's witty, it's game, but it's offensive. No, that's a description of the reader. And readers must not describe themselves when they're talking about a book. You're just the reader. You. I mean, one is, one is just the reader. Um, one is just the recipient of the work that's made and done and finished. Yeah. There was, uh, you, you write in, in, in Mother's Boy how argument is the breath of life. And I was thinking about that while listening to you yesterday. And um, as someone who teaches and who's engaging with young people, I think 
something I'd love to ask you is maybe um, given that we live in this time where people are always offended, as writers, as makers, how do we how do we make without fear of, I mean, how do we not self-censor? Because it feels like anything you say, anything you do could be offensive. And I feel like there's the, the one freedom we have is in the work we make. And how do we protect that? Yeah, it's a real problem. I've caught myself self-censoring here and there. I now spend more time writing a book worrying about pronouns than about anything else. <laughs> I spend hours. His, and you have to go, his brackets or hers or hers brackets or that's that's clumsy then you go theirs that sounds to the ear that sound, I mean if, if language is important to you then these are barbarisms to make a single noun have a you know have a plural possessive it's it's a it's barbaric to your ear so then you have to think well what am I prepared now for this book never to be published because I wouldn't say there what do you do I think it's terrible that one is put in put in this position and you kind of you make, a kind of, you make a kind of peace with it. I wrote a novel, the last novel I wrote, which is what last night's talk was about, Live a Little. And I had trouble with that because there was a character in the novel. There was a, an elderly woman, a very funny elderly woman, probably the best character I've ever written, who is, it's wrong to say she's a racist because she know, she, she's playing games. But she has staff, and one of her staff is an African woman, and one of her, to look after her. And the, another of her staff is from Eastern Europe. And anybody who has had, who's dealt with carers knows, this is certainly the case in England anyway, that if you've got a carer from Eastern Europe and a carer from Africa, they will get on very badly with each other. They get on very, very badly. Hungarians and Nigerians, for some reason, get on very, very badly. So there's comedy in that. Um, but, she, but, but the fact that she is, you could, I suppose, say she's a racist, caused pu my publishers in America particularly, they didn't know what to do. And they said, but you can't... She says, look how she uses the word black over here. I said, yes, but, that, but that's her. This is not me. I am not this person. This is a character in the novel. Your characters in the novel can say, what if I wanted to put what? Must I never write about a racist? You should be pleased that I'm writing about a racist. And this is the greatest problem at the moment. And it, and it is, has got to do with social media, where there is the concept of dramatic talk has vanished. Because everything is a severation. I say this, you say that, I say this. It's never a, it, you, there's, no, there's no emoji for irony. There's no emoji. You can't go, I want an emoji that goes, well, I don't quite mean what I'm saying here. And I half do and I half don't. On the other hand, if I may put it as the late Henry James, there's no such emoji. So the emojis are, emojis are statements of brute asseveration. I think, I say, I think, I say. And the world that we all inhabit is... And light years away from that. And, and to be judged according to the standards of severative um, social media is, is appalling. And I don't know the answer to it. I, do, I can only assume it will pass. People keep saying it's going, it's passing, everything's all right now. And then the next day you hear a hideous story of... But if someone can tell me how I sort out his, hers, theirs, how'd you do it? Okay, um, we have to stop now. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Howard. And uh, yeah. Thank you.